Hello chess fans. Today I'm excited to show you another game from Anatoly Karpov. In this one he's going to play black in 1977 against Stefano Tatai, an international master from Italy. This game is a really wonderful demonstration of the punishment that awaits players who neglect their development and forget to castle. Something that all of us have probably done at some point and something that we would hope to punish in our opponents. Tatai is going to open the game with knight f3 and Karpov is going to respond with c5 and we get a symmetrical English. After d5 the symmetry is broken and we get a trade on d5 and a recapture with the knight. This is a very rich and popular position and it's possible to play e4, d4, pawn e3, or other moves still here. However, both players in this game chose to fianchetto their bishops, g3, g6, bishop g2, and bishop g7. At this point, Tatai plays a bit of a new move, queen a4 check. This move has been played in other games, but black has outperformed white in those games, and I think that this is already a suspect move. Sometimes I find that when I play stronger players, I'm inclined to force the play, giving moves that... Uh, giving checks like this or playing other moves that create threats so that I have some kind of sense of control against my stronger opponent. I kind of wonder if this might be happening here with the opening variation that Tatai has selected, but after knight c6 and Tatai's idea of knight g5 to attack d5, Karpov's natural response of e6, and Tatai's response of knight e4 attacking c5, I think this really works out in Karpov's favor. He's doing a better job of developing his pieces, uh, controlling the center, and getting closer to castling than Tatai is with his knight dance and queen check. Now, knight to b6 is a strong move. It was difficult to defend the c5 pawn. For example, b6 is not possible because the knight hangs. So knight b6 queen moves, and then pawn c4 gives the pawn some stability, and it stops pawn b3 and pawn d3, which would be good moves to try to free this bishop and help uh, break the white position out. Knight a4 is now uh, to Tai's idea, and he goes after the c4 pawn. He's trying to undermine the knight that is defending the c4 pawn. I think this is really not very good. Um, in fact, I know this is not very good because Stockfish is confirming that this is not very good. It shouldn't surprise uh, chess players that a move like this, that takes a piece that's already developed, you know, and sends it to the edge of the board and seek uh, in an attempt to seek its exchange, should backfire, especially for a player who's underdeveloped and not yet castled. These are going to be problems that plague to tie, and we can point to the excessive queen moves, the excessive moves of this knight, and the excessive moves of this knight as leading to Tatai's problems. It shouldn't really surprise you that Karpov isn't even going to try to defend this pawn. Instead, he's just going to castle. This is an excellent pawn sacrifice when the opponent is dancing around with their pieces instead of getting castled and finishing development. Knight takes b6, pawn takes b6, some might be inclined to go for queen takes b6 instead, trying to keep the pawn structure healthy, but that's not important. What's important is dynamic play, and by taking back with the a pawn and leaving the queen on d8, black maintains more open lines and mobility for the pieces. Pawn e5, threatening bishop e6. The queen simply steps back, saying, all right, I'm going to have to go back anyway. Let's go back now. Knight d4 attacking the queen again, and queen b1. Queen d1 was also possible, but the queen tries to get out of the way. Now f5 pushes the knight back, and e4. If Kasparov was playing the black pieces instead of Anatoly Karpov, I would have bet on the more aggressive move f4, the more confrontational move f4. But Karpov's a different kind of attacker. He loves control when attacking, and instead he plays this move e4, which restricts all of the white pieces and makes it harder for white to break out in the position. Tatai does try to break out, pawn up to d3, trying to challenge that e4 pawn. If he could get rid of it and get castled, he would be doing totally fine. Karpov finds the only move that maintains the initiative, b5 
intending pawn to b4 when the white knight is severely inconvenienced. Bishop e3, developing and looking to exchange this very, very strong knight. Pawn b4 attacking the knight, and the knight retreats. Rook e8 now gives to Ty, I think, his one opportunity in quite a while to get off, maybe not scot-free, but close to it. So this is a serious inaccuracy. Instead, bishop e6 with ideas of various tactics, including uh, or starting with pawn b3 and including even uh, bishop b3 and knight b3 in some lines, is a stronger move. Bishop e6 just is more threatening. After rook e8 here, it was possible to play bishop takes, queen takes, and just castle. Karpov still has plenty of compensation, but there's no clear way forward for him, and Tatai might hold this position together. This is definitely the best opportunity I think he had uh, since he took the, took the sacrificed pawn. Instead, he traded on e4 first and then took on d4. This looks like it should be just about the same thing, but I think this is very different. Now if he tries to castle, he's not busted, but the capture on e4 has let this bishop out. Now bishop g4 is creating more threats that Tatai needs to deal with, and in general, he's struggling to complete his development in this position, and Karpov has more open lines to work with. This is a very serious initiative for Karpov, and I think he is probably not quite winning, but very close. It's a large objective advantage. Instead, jumping back, he tries the move a3. I think a3 is really just an indication that he's not sure what to do uh, because he's concerned about castling. But after a3 here, we get bishop g4 from Karpov, very, very strong. Now castling is met by the simple capture on e2. And h3, which I'm sure Tatai considered, gets busted tactically. This is a good point to pause the video and try to figure out what Karpov might have played here. The key here is not to retreat the bishop. You would get trapped. And you definitely don't want to go back along this diagonal and lose your initiative. But you don't have to go back. You can go forward. Bishop to f3. This is a very nice move. Not too difficult, but very aesthetic. If bishop takes, pawn takes, the pressure on e2 wins the game. And if you push the pawn, queen c4, threatening queen e2, is completely busted for white, and you cannot find a good move in this position. It is possible for Tatai to take with the pawn instead, but after pawn takes check, opening up the rook, first off, if knight e3, simply rook takes e3 is crashing through. But if king f1, yes, this is a good move, but even better is queen d5. Very, very nice. We're attacking g2, threatening to take it with a fork. And if white tries something like rook h2 to defend that bishop, you know, hoping to exchange and after rook takes to survive, we have queen c4 check, and we're mating down here. Very, very pretty line. So, jumping back to the game, after bishop g4, queen c2 was tried. This is another good point to pause the video and try to figure out what Karpov played here. It's one of his most appealing moves. The move he goes for is queen d3. This is really beautiful. Now, this is a sham sacrifice. A sham sacrifice is a sacrifice that doesn't really give up material. With tactics, you're going to regain the material, but that makes the move no less beautiful. After queen d3, there's no defense for white, I think. If knight e3, you can simply trade here and take on b2, and then you're going to take on a3 as well with a completely winning position. If you pull the rook over to try to defend the queen this way, it's more difficult to find the winning idea for black, but pawn takes a3 it is. After pawn takes a3, still, if you take the queen, you will also uh, lose the white queen, and so after, oops, after pawn takes a3, you get queen takes a3. Now, technically material is equal here, 
but black has a very, very large initiative and has threats like rook c8 winning c1. White is not going to be able to get castled in this position without losing material, and black in general is just dominating the board with the rooks, the queens, and the bishop. One should not need to do much more than look at this position for a few seconds to appreciate that the position is very, very bad for white. I'll mention one other line. If there's a capture on e4, uh, well, you can probably play rook c8, but you can also just take on e4 because this hangs. So jumping back after queen d3, Tatai did decide to take on d3. Pawn takes d3. Pawn takes d3 check. So we're winning the queen back, but not quite yet. It is totally possible and very good to take the queen. But Karpov saw the very, very good capture of the queen and found yet a better move. When you see a good move, look for a better move. Most of the time, I think that that's really quite bad advice, but here it works very well. The king takes on d3, and now we need an intermediate move before we capture the queen. Rook check, and rook takes. And now white takes on b4. Now, in this position, to tie is still up two pawns, and we traded queens. So you might think that this is not so bad. But hopefully if you think that, you'll kind of reevaluate very, very quickly. The king on b4 against the two rooks and the two bishops should pretty clearly be basically checkmated. And there are a number of ways to win the game. You might pause the video again here and try to find a way that convinces you. There are a lot of ways to win, so I'm not going to tell you there's just one solution. But you do want, as black in this position, to find something clear and decisive that convinces you this is a win. And even if I'm playing Stockfish or Magnus Carlsen, I can convert this, right? You need something that is clear. And Karpov finds that. He plays rook over to d2. The knight now is just humiliated. It's stuck on the edge of the board, and if it moves anywhere, it's going to drop either b2 or f2, and when those go, there are also further consequences. So, Tatai tries to save the knight by stepping up with pawn f3, blocking off the bishop's attack on the knight. But now, again, there are many ways to win, but bishop f8 check is a good one. If the king goes to a light square, a check from this bishop will get this bishop to safety, because obviously it's attacked at the moment by the pawn f3, and that will allow black time to take on g2. So the king moves to a dark square, a5, and the bishop simply goes back to d7. At this point, to tie resigned. There are, again, many ways for black to win, but the most convincing explanation, I think, of why uh, why it's time to resign in this position is that the bishop is under attack, and if the bishop saves itself, simply bishop c5 traps the white king, and there will be no defense to rook a8 and checkmate. So bishop c5 and rook takes g2 are two threats that win a piece. There are probably also other ways to checkmate the white king, but this is enough to force resignation for very, very good reasons. I hope you like this game. I think it's a really beautiful game. I love the centralization from Karpov. I love the harmony in his pieces. And it's always great to have another good example of why you really should castle and develop your pieces in a game of chess. If you like this game, please consider liking it uh, on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, adding a comment uh, with your thoughts on the game or maybe some suggestions for future videos, and also consider sharing it with a friend who you think might also like it. Thanks so much and have a great day.